to call the May 4th, 2022 uh, Port and Commerce Advisory Board regular meeting to order. Um, can we, everyone join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Clark, can you take roll, please? Smith. Uh, here. Jaffa. Here. Paquette. Present. Hughes. Walters. Lawrence. Chair Holmdahl. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is citizen comments um, on any subject except those scheduled for public hearing. Those who have signed in will be given the first opportunity to speak. Time is limited to three minutes per speaker and 36 minutes total time for this item on the agenda. Mr. Clark, is there anyone signed up to speak? There is no one signed in. Is there anyone on the floor who would wish to speak at this time? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on um, to the approval of the agenda and the consent agenda. I need a motion and a second. Uh, I make a motion. And I'd like to speak to the agenda. We have a, uh, as as we have a second. I'll second it. Okay, moved and seconded. Um, any changes to the agenda or discussion? Uh, I want to make sure that we have the uh, um, applications for the PACAB uh, advisory, uh, heat loop advisory board on the agenda. Yeah, we're going to take care of it at the report section. Is it an agenda it's item? It's not on the agenda item. Um, okay. According to the clerk, it doesn't have to be, and we can take care of it during the report. Okay. Any other comments on the agenda? Okay, Mr. Clerk, can we vote on the agenda, please? Okay, Jaffa. Yes. Smith. Yes. Biquet. Yes. Chair Holmdahl. Yes. Your agenda and consent agenda are approved. On the consent agenda was the approval of the April 6, 2022 regular meeting minutes and the approval of the April 20th special meeting minutes. Thank you. Uh, next is special orders, presentations, and reports. We have no proclamations or awards. Does administration have a report to provide? Good afternoon, PACAB. Um, on page four and five, you'll find my report to you. The topic of housing has been something that PACAB's been working on and discussing recently, so I wanted to provide you just a really high-level update on a few of the projects that the city has underway. Um, I would add just one item regarding number one, the Hemlock Subdivision Planning and Zoning considered two resolutions, 2022-009 and 2022-010 for the rezone and then the replat of the Hemlock Subdivision parcel. Um, unfortunately, those two items failed. Um, but at least 009 will be coming back forth um, due to reconsideration on their June 7th meeting. Um, city's hope, city administration will continue to work on this project and we're hoping that it continues to move forward. We all know that we're in a housing crisis at the moment. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys kind of a high level update on our three big projects that are gonna impact housing and looking forward to reporting uh, status updates to you guys when you come back from your hiatus in September. So, and I'll take any questions that you might have. Any questions? Okay. It's not on here, but you had talked about having a meeting with the borough about getting them to open up some land. Could yep. you give us a report on that? Yeah, good question. Um, so we've met um, a couple times. Um, the community development director and myself have met with um, our borough representative Cindy Eklund to talk about it. We had a, a Zoom meeting with Marcus Mueller um, in their planning department and we have a follow-up in-person meeting with Marcus next week. I think it's Wednesday or Thursday. He's going to come over and we're going to actually walk some of the parcels that they have in mind and then sit down and with a map. Um, they've got some property out on Old Exit Glacier Road kind of on the would that be the southwest side of the road that they're looking at selling this coming August. Um, as we all know, the city doesn't have authority over land outside of city limits. We're going to continue to advocate for where appropriate, possible, and feasible for the, to, the borough to open up property for residential development as well. 
so because they're a second class borough they cannot institute any kind of zoning has there been any discussion about um, covenants or some other way of ensuring that if they do open land up, that it just doesn't turn into vacation rental properties? That's a good question. So I'm not aware of any of those types of conversations, but they can, inside of the purchase and sale agreement, when they go to sell the property, they can include a provision that the land would be developed for purposes of a residential development within X amount of time. And they're working with their legal folks to try to find ways to craft that into the purchase agreement itself. Thank you. A, a question. Um, I, I attended the um, rec uh, uh, center um, feasibility briefing last night. And they talked about um, fairly large, you know, five-acre plots of land available. I was wondering if there's any coordination between that study and uh, and what we're working on with housing. Um, I don't think I understand your question. Well, they, they, they have identified apparently several large city lots. Um, so. How, how does that fit in with the housing situation? Is there any coordination or? Mm, trying to figure out how to answer that comprehensively. So the Planning and Zoning Commission will be going back and looking at the municipal land plan in the next couple months and identifying um, which lands the city owns and their best and highest use. So that's one piece. In terms of the feasibility study, we're just going to really have to wait and see what the determination is. I mean. Their Victus is going to do a survey. They're hoping to get at least 300 responses from the community. Um, that should be forthcoming in the next probably two to three weeks. Um, but in terms of the, the footprint necessary and the type of facility that they're going to be looking at, I mean, that's just all going to be subject to what the community wants. I mean, if, if the community says that we want a large walking track, mixed use facility, um, that's going to be, you know, 20,000 to 40,000 square feet plus parking, etc. It's a whole other ball of wax. If we say we want a, a two-sheet ice arena, that's going to obviously be a larger footprint. So without figuring out what type of use it's, is going to be involved, it's hard to make a determination on um, the size of property that would be necessary. Yeah, it just kind of struck me as interesting that there was that, you know, that much land that they're looking at and we're trying to figure out where to put houses and, and just trying to kind of reconcile those two statements there. But Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely that's a, a nice piece to add to our uh, quality of life, though. So good to yep. see it going. Thanks. Remember, Jeff? I'm trying to think about a way to bring several <laughs> topics together, but I don't think that's appropriate. First of all, we are at a deficit right now with the borough because, speaking of Seward, does not have a member on the Planning Commission. There has been, there is still an opening for a Seward representative. Um, I believe that position has been filled, correct? Mm -hmm. The City Council provided a recommendation to the Kenai Peninsula Borough to fill that position. Uh, it's, it's uh, with my, the borough to fill it. It must be very new because my connection to the Planning Commission, just uh, to Virginia Morgan actually two days ago, was that it hadn't been filled. The borough has to take it up. And fill okay, it. all right. So that will help a great deal. Uh, second, along with that, I, I, I'm aware that there is property on the East Peninsula including Moose Pass and Seward, that uh, being reclassified, uh, including land in the Seward area, some of which I think you and Marcus will talk about. Land sales with the borough have been problematic. You know, Hope, Cooper Landing have had uh, significant land sales. It, they, they cannot uh, hold anybody to a specific use. If someone bids to buy a piece of property, they, it's theirs. They can do whatever they want with it. There is no zoning. There is nothing in a covenant that can continue through. If they if they say we'd like to we'd like to suggest this land for uh, townhouses, an owner can buy that by single family homes or vice versa. But there's nothing that can be done about that. Economics would prevail. The bigger overlying thing, and and I think. I think that, number one, I agree that we have a, a land issue where we need to get land into private development. I've talked to uh, private developers, and that's clearly where it starts. 
along with financing is having land available and having regulations appropriate for developers to build is important also but a lot of stuff is coming on the market very quickly I think it will be on the market very quickly including Berlin probably Seward land uh, it, it, the hemlock subdivision is not Fort Raymond is that correct correct okay so that's another parcel that will be looked at uh, there's there's a almost a five million dollar piece of property along the coastline near Fognac logging that will be on the that's on the market if all this stuff comes together at once and it it, it, it tends to dilute planning and I'm concerned that it doesn't become chaos. I'm not entirely sure the borough is the one to look at to prevent that. So the only other person, the only other entity is the city. But I think that's something, you know, it's always feast or famine, you know that expression? Well, if, if we open up all this land at once, it, your planning might go out the window. So I would just suggest that that be kept in mind and that public-private cooperation as much as possible be uh, uh, solicited. And I don't know what you do with with uh, a $4 million piece of property that's beautiful property. The guy can do what he wants with it if somebody buys that. Well, Bruce, I didn't catch a question in there, but I would say... Oh, it, it wasn't. It was a question. The only real question was, is there a planning commission uh, a member from Seward that can participate in all this and is the city aware of this potential feast chaos <laughs> well we didn't we didn't get into this hole overnight and we won't get out overnight as I think her mayor brought up a while back so and it's gonna be multifaceted there is no golden key to our housing problem this is going to be a multifaceted approach it's going to take us a long time we need to be strategic and we need to acknowledge the scale of our problem and there's been a lot of really great commentary by our schools talking about how they can't get teachers we met yesterday with um, uh, the new director over at Providence they can't get nurses and doctors so uh, the problem is urgent We're, and, and I guess the other thing is we don't have an option to stay where we're at this community is either going to grow or it's going to contract there is no status quo um, so we I would say city administration is committed to doing everything within our power to advocate for other entities to step up this is going to be solved by the borough the city um, there's a lot of land within city limits that's developable and would be appropriate for residential purposes and that's going to have to be taken on by private enterprise as well um, and I'm sure we'll be continuing to talk about housing in Seward for a very very long time we've been talking about it for almost 50 years so there's always going to be more people that want to live in Seward than are we're able to and I think that's just an acknowledgement that this is an amazing place um, yeah well, if, if I might, for the fall. If you have a question. Yes, I do. Uh, I do remember when there was a lot of empty houses here. So it, it, uh, there was, it, 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 it's growing for sure. I guess my real question, and, and when I think about what I said, was we have the city council, we have the city administration. Uh, the administration has a variety of facets. Being aware of the problem, uh, you're surrounded by the borough, but the city has its own authority. Is there enough um, professional experience in that group uh, to do this planning, or is there a need to reach out to some professional? I think we have the capacity we need to do the job. Good. Okay. Question answered. Thank you, uh, Member Cat. <clears throat> we this kind of uh, rides on uh, Chairman or uh, Committee Member Jaffa's comments. Um, the the one thing that I think we may not be prepared to do within ourselves is to answer the question of 
how much housing is needed. Not wanted, but needed. Um, and so that is a place where I, I will continue to, to suggest that we may want to have a consultant do that uh, analyzation. The other thing is, is kind of a question, and I'm sure you don't have the answer to it, but I just wonder how we might encourage the private entities to solve this problem themselves, right? Can't the Sea Life Center and the hospital and the school form some kind of housing co-op where they, as a, a group, identify some land, buy it, and build employee housing that they can share between them? Um, because Providence and the Sea Life Center and the school have had this problem for the same, you know, not 50 years for the Sea Life Center or the hospital, but in general, this has been going on forever. And we just seem like, it seems like everybody just spins their wheels about there's no housing. Uh, and I, I realize the city now is focused on it and we are trying to make some changes, but I, I wonder how we encourage the, the private enterprises to, to solve their problem. Because if you talk to other businesses around here, private enterprises, they have done that. Right? There are many businesses that have built housing for their employees. I guess I would say sewers got two pretty distinct challenges, big picture wise. It's the cost of bringing in water and sewer, as we know, is prohibitively expensive. And the city is probably best positioned to help solve that, that issue. And then obviously the availability of appropriate land. land. Right. So. Any other questions? Thank you for that report. Uh, we'll now move on to the Harbor Masters report. Mark? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I just want to touch up on some of my things since the uh, actions I wrote this. So the 337 to 50 tons are very busy. Um, we actually have a wait list for vessels that want in, went in and out of the water. So right now the wait list goes about a week or two. So. We might hear some complaints. We're trying to work double. When we have the crew, we're trying to do both sides of the bay. Um, and we're, when somebody cancels, we push someone in there right away if they're ready. And then sometimes they're not ready, but we're trying. We're working with them. Um, so that's a, that's a big issue right now is this. And we're also short a couple people because uh, Matt left. Tony moved up. Tony's doing great with the schedule. We're trying to work it. And we had another gentleman that's out for a little bit. Um, but we're definitely trying to work with the schedule. I have some guys come in on overtime to work through some lifts. So, um, yeah, so we're trying on that part. Um, next, all the water is on in the harbor except for J float itself um, because they got to chlorinate and then dechlorinate after they tested it. The pressure testing came out fine. The fire line pressure testing came out fine. But for the potable water, they got to chlorinate and then dechlorinate. Then when that's done, then we can open up um, the JDOC water, but the rest of the harbor should be on. And I think they're going to get JDOC fish cleaning station open because it's separate. So we've got to hang some uh, um, some hoses there and get that opened up. Um, like I said, so we're short of harbor worker two. We did make an offer. We haven't heard back yet. Um, we're going to open some of these weeks starting May 8th. Um, so on the launch ramp, the concrete the last of the concrete blocks should be here Thursday. They're finishing up. They're actually starting to form up for all the pouring the concrete for the embankments. The rest of the stuff, some of us on this barge, some will be on the next barge to finish up. Hopefully, they said if everything shows up, we can technically maybe open by Memorial Day weekend. But we do have another launch ramp, and there's plenty, plenty of room over there for parking and everything. So that's what's nice about having two launch ramps. But um, we are working on that. Uh, Global Diving finished the Anno project, and we did get the cell survey, so that project should be um, just fin finally finishing up there. Um, why did we talk about that? We talked about opening up uh, GKNL flow. We're going to open it up as soon as the declination is done, then they close up the, um, the deck boards so there's no tripping hazards. So then uh, that will open up. We can put most there. There will be no water on those floats until the pedestals arrive. Pedestals are still kind of supply chain issues for the, electric, the pedestals because the water is actually inside those pedestals, kind of like the new on our BG, uh, ABC float. 
So that's why, but they can run over the J dock, uh, the J float area there and get water. Uh, if we have to, we can run a hose down, you know, and they can just come down between J and K and, and water and get some water. We'll, we'll figure out something there. Um, pretty much it. Take any questions? Please ask any questions for Norm. Uh, yeah, uh, I should remember the, the launch ramp being redone in my memory, but what's the life of that? So we have to properly maintain it for 20 years because it's part of fishing games. They pay 75%. So part of it, we have to maintain it, but they're talking 50 years. 50 years? Yeah, to 30 to 50 years. I won't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so the Northeast Fish Cleaning Station, I mean, not Fish Cleaning, Northeast Launch Ramp was done in 90, in 98, no, excuse me, 88, 89. So it's, you know, the, the planks are failing. Okay. So that's what. And this is a new design. It's supposed to be better and last longer. And uh, the second question, uh, uh, Moffat and Nicole. Nickel. Nickel. Uh, how do you select your engineers? Do you have a standing agreement with uh, for marine engineering? So the reason we went with Moffat and Nickel for the crane, because they did design, they already had a, a, a report done and and do a crane, they actually did the one across the bay. Mm -hmm. So we had all the information already. So instead mm -hmm. of reinventing the wheel, we went back with Moffat and Nickel on the crane. Because <coughs> they already had all their technical data, I guess you want to say. Do you? Go ahead. Uh, do you, um, what, what mechanism does the city have to uh, uh, determine that a contractor is not, you don't want to invite them back? Well, that's a tough subject. Um, Can you? Yes. Okay. There's a, it's in the code, but I'm trying to remember. I don't want to misspeak here. So if there was some litigation that went on and they didn't fulfill their last contract, things like that, the city can say no, but it will go through the attorney to make sure you do everything right. There is some way that you can't you, you live with somebody that's malperformed. Yes, sir. Okay. Any more questions for the Harbor Master? Okay, uh, seeing none, we're going to move on, and I'm going to exercise my right as chair to stick in a chair report here, um, which um, I've been advised is the best way to do that. Um, we don't have a standing chair report, but I am going to give one now. Um, my report is an update on the ad hoc committee for the heat loop project, um, and we created we appointed uh, five people to that body um, at our last meeting, and since then we've had, uh, it can be up to seven members, and since then we've had two letters of interest come in, um, and I'm going to, at this time, appoint those two members to that board. Um, those members are Mary Tugas and Mike Brown. Oh, I didn't realize this was double-sided. <laughs> yeah, there's one on each side. Um, that group will be meeting um, on May 5th at 1 p.m. at the fire station, um, and so we look forward to hearing what they're working on. Um, and that concludes the chair report. Um, any questions on that? Yeah. Uh, not on that report, but um, you gave you were able to attend a current a recent uh, council meeting with a quarterly report. Yes. And how did that go? It went very well. It was quick and. There were hardly any questions. Um, I, we did get a lot of kudos for the work that we've been doing, um, and thanks for the information that we've collected through the housing discussion. Um, so there was a lot of approval there. Good. Thank you. Yep. Okay, with no more discussion there, we will move on to um, other reports and announcements, and next is the Alaska Railroad Report. Everyone, excuse um, my very casual uh, dress today. We are flipping over to our summer operations and planning for our first cruise ship on Monday. Mm. Uh, first Coastal Classic will be on Saturday. Yeah, my written report in the packet. Um, April is one of our busiest months, so it's really the time of year when uh, freight companies and um, construction companies are staging for their projects in western Alaska. So we have a lot of vessels coming and going. People are doing last um, roundup maintenance items. Um, we have the Sekuliak in and out. So we have research vessels coming and going. We have Alaska serves training. Um, 
and uh, you know it's just kind of a, an exciting time of year people are shaking the dust off what they start needing to do we did even have some freight trains so we have trains that bring down freight for that activity and then trains that that move north um, with other items and um, I wanted to give folks some numbers because they're usually pretty interested. So our forecast this year at the Coastal Classic is 40,000 passengers coming into Seward on the coastal and then 30,000 people going out of Seward. So that's a nice um, big number of passengers coming and going. Um, and you might wonder why it's a little higher coming rather than going. A lot of those um, people that come down here uh, do end up spending the night and then getting on a cruise, a cruise ship in the morning. So that's where you see some of that, um, you know, kind of, uh, or they'll come down, you know, go on their day cruises and then take a, stay in the community or take a bus um, back. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Oh, cruise ship season, uh, our estimate for passengers this year are between 150 and 175,000. I went back and looked and that's closer to our 2016 numbers. Um, one thing that ultimately happened is um, Holland and Princess ships, so the Sunday ships, um, they've been trying to move out of Seward actually for 12 years because they have a, a tie in Whittier um, and they were kind of dragging their feet because this is a better port for them. Um, but uh, they are moving this year and that move was planned even pre-COVID. So um, we're dropping down a little bit and then also what you'll see is those ships are running at 60 to 70% capacity and they actually think that as the season continues, um, that's going to ramp up closer to 100% capacity. Um, what's nice for Seward is that they have cruise ships in the southeast, so we've had a soft opening. They have all their systems in place, um, uh, you know, as it pertains to COVID. And then they also see as they're continuing to have a successful cruise ship season, they think their numbers and their bookings will just um, go up and up. We have entered, the railroad has entered into port agreements. Um, with all the cruise lines and maybe a highlight that I think the community should be most concerned with is um, if a passenger is found to have COVID, we have some spaces set up. Uh, well, let me back up. Every single passenger, every single crew member that's able to get vaccinated on a cruise ship is required to get vaccinated. So children, I think five and under, do not have the ability to be vaccinated. They will be tested. Um, in addition to being fully vaccinated, those ships also are requiring a vaccine, or um, yeah, in addition to being fully vaccinated and having your vaccine card, you also need to have a COVID test within 48 hours. And the message being given to those passengers is that has to be done in Anchorage. So if they don't have their vaccine card, they don't have their test in Anchorage, they won't be brought down to Seward. Um, just because they have been in contact with Providence and also in us and we just don't have the capacity. So we're, the, the you know, there's going to be people that come ahead of time to the community, um, but the bulk of everyone will be stopped in, in Anchorage so we won't have that transportation problem. It, but it won't be our problem. So the cruise ships in all those agreements are in charge of transporting any outliers from that system. And then finally, I have a flyer to um, provide. Our Alaska Railroad President and CEO will be down Friday, May 13th, and that will be with a contingent of um, uh, leadership, not only from the railroad, but also from Royal Celebrity, who has been named our partner in our dock project. So they will be here for their first ship this year, um, and we'll be doing a cookies and coffee um, presentation at the chamber. So I have these to pass out. And then, um, I don't know if you could just pass those that way. There's, there's extra for the clerk. Um, and then I don't know, I'm, I'm available for questions if there are questions um, from the board. I have a question. Uh, yeah, I can remember. Yeah. Uh, so, What's the uh, plan if you have a ship that comes in and and has COVID cases? Yeah. So if there if there's someone with a COVID case, then you know it'll be patterned after um, what we what we were able to you know contain with and working with Alaska. So those agreements are not only with the railroad, but also with they're reviewed and approved by Alaska Health and Social Services. So the plan is if anyone ha it has COVID on the ship and they've been isolated, 
they'll instantly go on a shuttle or transportation, so they won't even be released into town. So they'll step on the dock, which is not even solid ground, be loaded into that transportation option, and then taken straight to Anchorage. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Well, thank you for the railroad's COVID policy. I, I, it sounds like you have one, but it's mostly tag along to the cruise ships. Cruise ships are the ones that are requiring the vaccination card issue, not the railroad. Yes, yeah, so we, the port of Seward that we manage is a landlord port. So we, um, what they've worked out with the state of Alaska is they're in charge of what their plans are because they have to manage them. Mm -hmm. So that's correct. The, the mm -hmm. Second. Uh, I'm not sure where this falls between the chamber and the railroad. I know you guys do coordinate, but uh, you know, the whole issue with the number of people to come into town, I know there's the, all these buzzwords about more butts on the boat and one more day and, and, and all that. It's the quality of the visitor that, and how much money they leave here. Uh, is there, uh, you know, the railroad picks people, takes people off the boat, puts them on the train, sends them north, but is there, um, is there a discussion between the railroad and the, and the chamber about that lag? How, how, how many more, one more night uh, visitors there are? Um, because these raw numbers don't yeah, say it. Yeah, who, who it is. So, you know, this year I think will be different. Um, but I'll also say, because I've started to notice, and, you know, this is just a lead into the answer, but I have people that will argue um, or maybe... Um, say that Seward doesn't need cruise ships and they'll say um, there's two reasons they'll say because those cruise ship passengers impact our town too much we already have enough tourism we don't need those cruise ship passengers it's it's too impactful and we're too busy and then that same person will argue with me and anyways they're just getting on buses and trains and going to Anchorage so it, it, we really haven't so the more I hear that argument from this you know like the same person will give me that argument um, you know, I think that would be a good question to work with um, KPED to try to dial down on which lines actually have people stay before and after, which lines, which ships feed more into our economy. Um, and they've done some of that, and I've seen reports for that in the southeast. So that might be a study that we want to partner with KPED to look at. Um, <clears throat> like the Viking model that we have, and those ships are new, um, just pre-COVID. Um, you know, they have that model where they stay three days. So the first day they arrive, and with Viking, every passenger gets a free excursion that Viking pays for. So all those passengers, their baseline excursion is going to the Sea Life Center, um, you know, doing a dog sled tour, and then they can upsail from there. Um, and then that second day is when they flip the ship. People debark, people embark. And then the third day, the embarking passengers they have their opportunity to do an excursion. So it would be interested, um, interesting, you know, Cape Head could talk to um, Sea Life Center, Keenock Yards Tours, Major Marines, and maybe filter some of the proprietary information that folks don't want to right. give out in general. But like the dog sleds, um, and just anecdotally over the 12 years, so, you know, nine years with, or 10 years doing, doing ships without COVID, you know, I've seen more and more independence. Like as the cruising um, demographic gets younger, people are more able to just get on the internet and make their own plans. So you see more and more people at the very least staying for the day and then going on the Coastal Classic in the evening. And that's why the Coastal is in such demand, is, is I believe it does have to do with the, the cruise ship people staying all day, eating at restaurants, you know, not putting too much demand on the nightly rental piece or the hotel piece, but, you know, taking advantage of a day trip and then going back. But I think, you know, I've even talked to the community development director and we've looked at what they've done in the southeast to quantify that. Mm -hmm. And that would be a great idea for our community because then we'd really have some, you know, data and not anecdotal information. Follow up. Uh, yeah, and I think that would help talking to that person that you mentioned that is always doubting whether there's a benefit. But uh, specifically, does the railroad, uh, does, you know, the giant ships, 
well, I don't know how many passengers is on them versus the like the little Norwegian one that we got in there everybody gets off and spends time in town is there an advantage to the railroad as far as docking uh, rates or fees or longs or whatever your other charges would be the, the big ships small ships yeah the only well of course there is because of the the docking size and um, we do charge a passenger fee so the railroad when we're the end of the open jaw and we're a turnaround port you know makes more money for the railroad than there's those protocols but we definitely are an open dock and we don't like compare the two and say oh we're going to take this ship over this ship it really has to do with birthing application in our tariff it does have a historical you know you have a historical benefit if you've been coming to the community mm -hmm. um, for the right of, of a birth good thank yeah. you yeah Thanks. any other questions well good I'm excited next month to let you know how how well everything's going so I'll see you guys in a month <laughs> we're actually I don't think we meet next month oh yeah at the end of the in season. September we'll, okay. we'll okay. hear about it yeah. uh, we have a word session on the 18th and then, and then we're done okay so next will be our um, Chamber of Commerce report hello um, first I apologize for not having a packet um, just have been reworking some calendar um, dates and reports and everything so I will just verbalize my update to you and to kind of start with what Bruce our um, board member Joppa was referring to we've seen some data over the course of the past five years that the average stay in Seward is increasing um, each summer and in about 2017 it was two days and this past year it was 4.5 wow. so that definitely isn't cruise ship passengers only that covers the whole independent travelers as well but we have been making that um, transition into longer term stays at about four and a half days per visitor. Some exciting things at the Chamber of Commerce building. You may have noticed we have a big hole in the ground um, next to our bathrooms. We are officially starting to work on installing the electric vehicle charging stations. That hole will be filled with electricity right <laughs> and concrete <laughs> on friday and moving from there so we're um things are going along smoothly in that regard and we're really excited about that program have a lot of people asking about it so super excited to get that started um i also have one copy of our hometown guide that i got really really wet in my carry-on from portland um and i'll have more later on for you guys and we'll be able to trans um give them out throughout town, but this is kind of what you should be looking for when you're thinking about this hometown guide that we got um, printed and published full of community resources, history, culture, um, and then basics and things for people moving to town, in town seasonally, um, for them to use as a resource instead of navigating the depths of Seward Facebook Citizens Forum and things like that. We hope this helps out in some of those ways. Uh, if you're down in the harbor in the next couple of days, definitely swing by the Derby booth. We got interpretive panels installed that detail the history and purpose of the Silver Salmon Derby. They're really, really awesome. I have a super cool timeline and detail the fish restoration program and things like that. And a giant salmon so you can go up and measure how big your salmon is. So it's going to be a dirty panel for sure. So we, we'll be ready to clean it. Um, we're very excited for the first cruise ship on Monday. We'll have our booth down there for most of the cruise ships that come in, especially those Monday and Friday larger ships. And um, that person who is covering the cruise ship terminal will also be working in the Salmon Derby and doing like roving visitor center um, information. Because one of our main priorities this summer is to assist our visitors and our member businesses in providing high quality information so that the sewer visitor experience continues to be amazing even while some of our um, infrastructure resources are yet caught up there so kind of like what um, uh, board member Joppa was talking about is making sure everybody has a good experience when they get here that's definitely a priority for us this summer um, I also will be giving a presentation at the council meeting on May 9th about a, res a survey that we put out for housing and different housing needs and um, issues so I don't have a full survey to give to you a uh, full results to give to you today but um, we had about 150 respondents and looking at that general data some cool um, or some a statement I wanted to let you leave you with before the big presentation is that 40% of those respondents are looking for a private home with two to three bedrooms so that's definitely something to keep in mind as we move forward in this discussion and I'll have more formalized and fun graphs on May 9th so I'll be able to get that to you as well but just some information coming down the pipeline on that 
Um, also in the cruise shrimp realm, we this morning created a shareable calendar of cruise ships that we'll share out with the community so you can just add it to your Google Doc sheet. So that'll be available soon. And um, that's about it. Yeah, we're really excited about the summer and getting ready and it's been getting busy in the visitor center. So excited for all of the fun things to come. Our visitor center staff has been out and about learning about all of the um, vacation rentals available in town and different excursions doing their familiar familiarization trips. And then on May 12th, we have an ice cream social event at the Sea Life Center for people to kind of expand on that familiarization and potentially hire new employees if you're looking for a second job. So that's pretty much everything for me. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Any questions? Uh, first thing would be, you mentioned, I think 40% of the, in your survey about housing, 40% mm -hmm. of the responders were looking for private private homes. Mm -hmm. What was second? Second was um, seasonal rentals, I believe. Seasonal rentals? Yeah, uh, yeah, like a seasonal rental home. Mm -hmm. And beyond that? I can't speak off the top of my head on okay. that. Um, it was something I just looked up while you were t having okay. the conversation earlier. So uh, I'll have those full results on May 9th. Thank you. Go ahead. Second, uh, it, it's really great news to hear the increase in the stays mm -hmm. from two something to four something mm -hmm. days of stay is, is major. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely something that we as a destination marketing organization um, always think about is creating um, high quality visitation and having those dollars stay around. Somebody that stays for four days is um, in a lot of ways a higher quality visitor than somebody who's here for one day because we don't have to do the introduction period each time they hear of welcome to Seward, here's the lay of the land, it's welcome to Seward go out and spend your money for three days. <laughs> so, so along with that, uh, there, there are at least two classes of those visitors. Mm -hmm. One one line, the, the, uh, the waterfront, mm -hmm. and really pretty expensive mobile homes, mm -hmm. whatever they're called, travel trailers. Or, uh, the other are people that are filling up the hotels. Like Best Western is closed right now. Yeah. Uh, Tugas' new hotel appears to be closed mm -hmm. right now. Although the other one is open, Murphy's is closed, I think King or whatever it is now. Well, they're all closed, so they must open Memorial Day or something mm -hmm. like that. What, what is the difference between those two visitors? And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that those are, some of the people who are staying four days are staying in those, those mm -hmm. hotels. Is there, is, there, is there a different spending rate? Is it a different clientele? Um, I can't necessarily speak like I would be speaking anecdotally, um, but I think that there is probably some um, some validity to saying that those who are staying in hotels and um, vacation rentals would probably spend more in the community because they don't have as easy access to kitchens. Mm -hmm. A lot of RVs um, definitely, what we see is that they like to camp out, um, cook their own meals and do things in that yeah. RV. But at the end of the day, um, they're all visitors taking advantage of what we offer in yeah. the community. So I wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to say that we definitely want a RV visitor versus a hotel visitor or vice versa because in a lot of ways they overlap. Well, if, if, if I could, yeah. you, you, you mentioned one thing. I just uh, this winter we had a difficulty finding a place to eat. Mm -hmm. It wasn't impossible, but we did. Uh, one restaurant is, is expanding that I know. Uh, Thorns is the, now the Flamenco. Mm -hmm. I believe they're expanding. Is there enough eating? Eating? Yes. Tables, chair, whatever you call it. So I think if we all remember back to last summer, that was a big issue that we faced constantly is um, on a local level finding a place to eat and then on a visitor level long wait times and um, issues in different restaurants throughout. I think this summer we're more prepared for visitation numbers as we were last year. It seems that um, different restaurants have been able to kind of find a firmer ground as we approach this um, upcoming season. I also know that there's a few secondary options besides sit-down restaurants that are available this summer as well including food trucks and um, 
tens and parts, which will help alleviate that. Something I'm really excited about is that a good majority of our vendors over Fourth of July weekend are new food vendors this year. So at our biggest holiday of the year, we'll have an expanded food option for people so that nobody leaves Seward saying, oh, I waited two and a half hours for a meal. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we probably could use more restaurants. Um, we could probably use some year-round as well. It sounds like yeah. we all had some issues with that last year, but it's making sure that the uh, demand is there for a restaurant to be open X number of days a week. Um, we can always say we want that to happen, but the demand and the business has to be there for that to actually happen. We can't ask a restaurant to do us a favor by being open on Mondays in February. It has to be there to correspond to it. So, something to work on. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you so much for no that problem. report. Um, so next on our agenda is a presentation um, by Rob Montgomery, our electrical director, on the project to clear trees and electrical lines. And I'm going to take this opportunity in the agenda to pass the gavel to Vice Chair Paquette. Um, I'm going to have to leave at 1.55. And if I have to leave during the 12.55, thank you. Um, if I can leave during the presentation, I want to make sure the meeting can continue. Sure. So I'm going to, at this time, pass the gavel. And... Very good. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I'm going to speak to you briefly about our right-of-way maintenance and clearing practices. Um, you've probably noticed there's been a good bit of work going on around town. So I thought it would be, you know, a good time. You guys also requested it. So, uh, Brenda, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, just so you, for background, we have two different types of right of rights of way that we maintain. Uh, we have the distribution rights of way, which is our lower voltage power lines. Those are the lines that you typically see in your neighborhood or along city streets. Uh, the transmission uh, right, rights of way, the, those are the high voltage power lines carrying electricity from the power plants and into substations, and then that's where the voltages are reduced and distributed on the distribution power lines. Um, our amount of transmission, uh, for the most part, we maintain transmission from our Rawling substation near Moose Pass, down the Seward Highway, all the way into our Fort Raymond uh, power plant. And then we also maintain transmission line going um, from the Seward Highway to the end of Nash Road. So that's all of the transmission that we're responsible for maintaining. And we own a little bit more transmission from Lawing uh, substation in Moose Pass over to uh, Dave's Creek in Cooper Landing. Uh, but Chew Gatch, they have distribution on that, so they maintain that for us uh, today. Okay? Uh, let's see. Typically when you have your uh, transmission distribution, your transmission poles are going to be the much larger structures that you see in distribution will be smaller or underground, okay? Now some of the factors that we look at when we're looking at the clearances that we would like to have uh, as we maintain our rights of way um, are the first and foremost is voltage. The higher the voltage of the power line, the greater the clearance that you're looking to get. Uh, some other factors that play a role would be vegetation. Uh, the type and the denseness. So let's say that we're looking at uh, trees that grow quickly. Uh, that may determine that we want to get back on a regular cycle to cut those uh, more often. Terrain. The more difficult the terrain, uh, the greater the clearance you're also seeking. The reason for that is because it's so difficult, you would like to have a greater clearance span so you're not having to come back as often. Uh, to maintain those areas. In saying that, the terrain also can make you go the other way. There are some places in Alaska where we can't get the clearance we would like to have because of the terrain. So in those cases, the right of way is, is the, the width of it is much smaller. And then access. A lot of people do not think about the access uh, that it takes for us to maintain our power lines or to get in if you're in a power restoration situation. And so, you're looking for the access points. If there are areas where you do not have good access, again, you may be looking to clear uh, a, a wider span so that you're, you're not having to worry about uh, outages as often. 
Okay. Our desired clearances, if you look for distribution, uh, we would prefer to be 15 feet on each side of the power line. Um, again, I think we usually accomplish that with most of the uh, clearing and trimming we do. Uh, there are some areas, again, based on uh, the terrain and the layout of the property where it may be a little less than that. Uh, for a transmission, transmission, most of what we have today is 69 kV. Um, but our system from Moose Pass into Seward is built to 115 kV. So the 69 kV, what we're looking for is 25 feet on either side of the power line. Now, where that may be different is let's look at uh, Nash Road. Nash Road, we're running adjacent to the highway the whole way. So we have fairly easy access should we have a problem on the line. Uh, we can get our bucket trucks right on the shoulder of the road and make repairs. On the back side of the power line, closer to the uh, wooded area, we would like to, again, maintain um, 25 feet if we could. In many cases, like when you're running down Nash Road, there are homes and properties to consider. So we will cut, you know, back, we would like to go minimum of 15 or we would prefer again to go 20 or 25, but typically we can go and work with property owners to determine, uh, you know, we talk about the project, here's what we need to do, and we try to figure out a way to work with them and minimize, because you know, we know how people uh, care about their properties, care about their trades, and so we don't want to just go in and clear cut without having those conversations, okay? And then for the 115 uh, KV, you look again at 50 feet on either side of the power line. If you look at that section um, in the photograph, that's what a 50, 50 feet on either side of the transmission line looks like. That's work that we did uh, last year up near Moose Pass. You guys may recall in 2020 that we had a number of uh, power outages in the winter of 2020. Uh, that was work that we made a priority coming in last year. So we uh, contracted with the crew, we got the work done, and for that section that we cleared um, last year, we did not have any power outages in that particular section over this past winter. So just to give you an idea. Uh, you can see at the bottom in the little gray box, the 2003 blackout across northeastern United States resulted in new national standards. Now, those standards apply more so to the lower 48 because all the grids are tied together. Yeah. But we try to uh, make sure that, that we're using best practices as well. Uh, because in the lower 48, if you're on transmission and you suffer an outage of some sort, you can be fined, the utility can be fined a million dollars a day uh, because they were not maintaining properly on the rights of way. Okay. Uh, in 2022, these are the targeted areas that we're, uh, we've been working on. I mentioned Nash Road, that's the transmission. Um, the work was being done for two reasons. It was time to get out and, and catch it up. But also we are planning to do, and I think most of you are aware, the infrastructure upgrade on Nash Road. Uh, while we, we had hoped to get that work started toward the end of the summer or early fall, based on materials, that may not happen this year, so we pushed into the spring. But we do have our uh, tree contractor on Nash Road, so we're hoping to get as much of that cleared and, and ready going into 2023 so the contractor can come in and, and start right away on the work. Um, on Nash Road, I mentioned wanting to work with property owners. Um, I've actually gone out personally and met with a handful of customers on Nash Road so that we could talk about the work we needed to do, but also kind of figure out how we could work with them. And in many cases, we've been able to do that. Okay, so uh, Seward Highway, you've seen some of the work going out of town from Bear Creek back into the city. Uh, Again, all of this has to do with reliability, cutting down on the number of power outages per sewer. 
there's a huge safety component as well. Um, when we have uh, public, but when we have our crews out working, we need to have that buffer so that they can work safely. So those are the things driving it. But again, I hope you've seen the work. I hope you've seen that, you know, if you, if you remember what it looked like before, in many cases it looks better today than it did. So uh, we've also, uh, working on distribution, going out Lowell Point Road. Linda, you may have seen some of that work happening. Old Exit Glacier, uh, again, distribution in that area. Uh, I live in that area, so I've seen some of that work going on. And then we're also planning to do work around the avalanche zone near Moose Pass over to Snow River. So that's on our list. We'll probably get to that later in the summer. Um, again, storms, wind, trees, all of those things are the reason that we have a lot of the power outages that we get. So any of the work that we're doing to minimize that benefits all of the people and the businesses that live here and work here in Seward. Uh, customer notification. This is something that I've made a priority for our department. Is anytime we're out to do clearing or trimming of any kind, I've, I want our guys to put out door hangers about three days in advance so that the property owner, if they have any concerns or questions, they can give us a call. And is that my 10 minutes? Go ahead. You good? Okay. So anyway, um, so the property owners have an opportunity to contact us if they have questions or concerns. Um, I know a low point. Uh, our guys missed a, a property, but we went back out. We met with them and we had a good discussion. But that's where I want to go. I want to make sure that we are actually working with the community as we're doing this work. Uh, just the straight way of doing it. Um, social media, we're in the process of upgrading what we're doing with social media. And so I also want to start putting our, our clearing and trimming schedules on social media on our Facebook page so people can follow us there as well. And uh, you heard me mention, we'll gladly go out and meet with customers as needed. Uh, but the bottom line for the utility is that we must maintain our right of ways to minimize power outages and for safety reasons. So I've got another slide here that uh, gives an update on the interconnect program. I can touch on that now or if you would like to ask questions about uh, the tree clearing and maintenance, we can go that route. A question on uh, if you could comment on the Saturday night outage. Um, yeah. what, was the, what was the cause and how did we get back? That was a, a small tree near Bear Creek uh, Fire Station and it was right i guess about 10 minutes before midnight <clears throat> so we had to have our crews actually go out and of course cut the tree out and once we did that we were able to get uh, power restored what it did is it tripped the breaker uh, in the substation at Dave's creek in cooper landing and until we could locate the fault which would be the tree in the line and get it removed once we do that what we do is communicate back to Tugach and say it is clear they'll close that circuit and if it holds, then the problem is solved. And so we did not uh, crank up the plant here because we figured it would be about an hour, maybe a little more. And so we did, did not need to go down that path. Okay. Uh, kind of a follow-up on that. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to pin things down, but I, I know somebody that lost some electronics that night, um, you know, house um, well systems and stuff. Is there any recommendations or... Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you know, when you're dealing with power surges, um, you can have equipment that will minimize damage to certain, uh, whether it's appliances or equipment. Um, but in some cases, you know, it may not work. So certain times, surges happen. And I know that uh, we had some in our property recently and we lost some of our camera equipment and whatnot. The, the whole house search uh, suppressors, do you have any thoughts on those or? I don't without doing more research. Okay. Uh, I know other utilities have information on that. And, yeah. and maybe one day we can we can have more on our website and for our customers. Yeah, that'd be helpful, thank you. Yep. 
Can you clarify, because there was some discussion in the background, that tree would, uh, fell, on, fell, right? It was not a brush clearing correct. problem where it was too close to correct. the line. Correct. Right. It fell. Yep. That is correct. It wasn't a large tree. did not take the, the power lines down. Um, small tree, again, we were able to get it out. But as you know, that's an area where we had just recently cleared. Right. But when you get high winds like that, right. if it takes a tree down, or in some cases you'll have the wind actually uh, take tops off of trees and blow them into the power lines. Right. So it, right. when you're in windy conditions, every utility in Alaska on Saturday was experiencing outages because of the wind. Right. Right. I just wanted for the public to know that that was not a part of the maintenance issues that nope. we've been having. No, yeah, we're, we're uh, working on it. And just out of curiosity, what, where they're widening the road in Moose Pass, mm -hmm. is that going to make it easier for you guys to get to those lines now? <coughs> well, we have access points in Moose Pass that we've been able to get, it, get into and maintain our lines in the past. That whole section where they're doing the DOT work is the section that we cleared last year. Okay. Now, if you look at what they've done on, on the steep section, they've removed that whole buffer of trees. So in some cases, you know, the pro is, yeah, we may be able to access it more easily, but we've also exposed all those other trees. All those other trees. Right. And so it could create some problems for us. We were talking uh, this morning in our staff meeting so what we're going to do is, uh, toward the end of the season, when these guys are wrapping up the work on Nash Road, we're going to send them back to Moose Pass and have them, uh, we're going to go out with them and target specific areas and trees so that we can take those out. Anybody else? Well, let, let's stay on that uh, area <coughs> for a minute, and then I'll start a question. Uh, GCI had outages maybe last winter, maybe the winter before, I can't remember. In that area that you're talking about, mm -hmm. the slides, mess, massive uh, underground stuff that they had, a, was a real problem. Uh, how do you how do you share, do you share the, um, the right-of-way with, with GCI? <coughs> well, they sometimes attach to our poles and we charge them for that. So in Moose Pass, I'm not sure if they, I guess they are attached, I'm so assuming. I know we're working with AT&T right now. They want to attach to our poles from Cooper Landing over to um, Moose Pass. We charge them a fee, um, but as we make our restorations, we're we're first because we got to get power back on, and then they can come in behind us and, and make whatever repairs they need to. Uh, and a second with that, I know how Chugak. Uh, uh, will respond to, has responded to this question, but when you have an underbuild on a distribution line, uh, where is the clearance rule? Is it the distribution 50 feet? No, you talk I, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I have a, I have a balance. Yeah. yeah, it would be 50 feet. If, yeah. you're, if you're at the 115, or I'm sorry, the 69, you're looking at 25 feet on either side, yeah. you'd be clearing the transmission. So, so regardless, if it, even though the right. bill would only require the smaller, you'll go to the bigger. Correct. Okay. So while Chugach is maintaining the power line from Cooper Landing to Moose Pass for us, mm -hmm. they have the distribution underbill, but they're clearing it to transmission with. That correct. was my understanding. Yep. Yep. And you'll be doing the same. Correct. Type of thing. Yep. Okay. Any other questions on this? So you want to do the interconnect? Sure, I've just got one slide here just to give you an update. Um, in 2021, I think all of you are aware, we were updating our information, kind of updating our process. Uh, we went through all of those steps. So today, uh, we have a very clear step-by-step -step process that we've outlined in both our application and on our uh, website, so customers can easily know what to do um, when they come to us. And with this step-by-step -step process, uh, we took that and worked very closely with Renewable Energy Solutions, which is the preferred vendor that worked with Solarize Sewer. And so in uh, 2021, we installed an additional 12 net meters on our system. Uh, going into last year, we had three, so now we're at a total of 15. 
Uh, we anticipate for 2022 that we'll probably get another 12 to 15. Uh, we currently have none in, in the queue, but Renewable Energy Solutions, has, they've been in town, so we know they're working with other customers. You're one of them. And uh, so I would anticipate another 12 to 15. We currently have 16 meters in our warehouse waiting to be used, and we've got another 20 that are ordered, and we anticipate getting those before the 1st of June. So we're well stocked for uh, interconnection. And that's pretty much it on that topic. Any questions or comments? Other. I can comment on the, on the solar. I, I guess I'd like to say everybody that I've talked to that has done this has, has no issues um, and has really appreciated doing business with both the city and um, RES. So it seems to be a, a very positive um, experience for everyone involved. Yeah. <coughs> and I appreciate you saying that. Our guys have worked hard um, um, understanding the interconnection process and working with the vendor out of Anchorage and I too think it's gone really well and, um, and I think that we're you know at that at, in that place in Seward where more and more people are going to interconnect and uh, and I'm glad we've got a process that seems to be working if I might just to be fair renewable energy solutions is not the only true provider Right. And by name, uh, your energy uh, consultants is certainly a, a marketable and a professional service that does the same thing. Okay. Yeah. And I mentioned them because they're they're the I understand. I understand. They came to this board. They did make a presentation. Gotcha. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Well, I'm one of the. Uh, we were slated for last year, and then it just got too late in the year. So we've got an array of solar panels coming. We'll be one of those net meters. Okay. Um, we also did a heat pump recently, okay. and um, very impressed with the process, the product, and the end result. Okay. Yeah. And go ahead. No, Chair uh, Paquette, if I might, it, it's interesting you mentioned heat pump because among the, the things I read just today across the country, there's going to be a shortage of heat pumps because they are ramping up in popularity dramatically, mm -hmm. which is good for the electrical utility. Sure. Now, but, uh, and I think you guys may know, we as a utility have been looking at heat pumps based on conversations we've had with people in the community. Um, we've been doing a very deep dive. We've been talking to other utilities here in Alaska that have heat pump programs. Uh, we met last week with uh, Darian Draper to get a handle, get an idea of what he's working on, how many installations he's made, and get his thoughts on some of the pros and cons. Uh, we're getting close to wrapping up the research we're doing. And before I share information here with this group, I would like to sit down with our city manager and a few other folks so that I'm not getting ahead of them. But we have been looking at it. Anything else? Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, I appreciate what the director said because there was a, uh, we've had uh, several uh, public come to the meetings that suggest that the city do more to encourage heat pumps, including some sort of subsidy. Uh, right. And I'm glad to hear I, nobody's committing to anything, but it may, may still be in discussion. Yeah, we're looking at it. And I'll be honest, I mean, one of the challenges that we have um, comes back to staffing and resources. Yeah. Um, if we were to do an incentive program, it sounds easy, right? Um, but you got to make sure if your name's attached to it with an incentive program, normally your customers are going to be calling you for information, just like they do with the interconnect program. Mm -hmm. And when you get customers calling to do their own homework and research, which is great, I encourage them to do that, and they're looking for some expertise. Uh, today, you know, who in our department 
I'm the only one in there that's been dealing with the heat pumps to this point. Um, so you have the, the, the processing part with the paperwork and the applications, and you have the phone calls. So it's something that we seriously have to look at because we have 10 employees, and eight of those employees are focused on operations. We have, you know, myself and, a, and an admin. So whatever we do, we have to take that into consideration because the last thing you want to do is roll out a program that you can't support properly. Thank you. Um, okay, so next on the agenda is new business. Uh, we've got uh, informational reports and our goal priorities and goals. Does anybody have anything they want to speak to those issues on? And I just have a question for the clerk. So we were unable to get any other presenters on the employee retention? Correct. Um, I did actually reach out to uh, Larry Harmon and the, I'm trying to think of the name of the fella that was the plumbers and pipe fitters maybe? Yeah. Tyler something? Um, and there is, well, the plumber and pipe fitter never called me back, and Larry Harmon is uh, too, didn't too indicate he was interested in doing it. So. Okay. Um. Bruce, did you have something? Well, you know, quite frankly, I um, I know we're towards the end of our our regular meeting session. But uh, I think that's a topic that's run its course, and I think the city has run with that along with council about, you know, gathering information about the housing labor issues. Uh, I think I think I talked at the last meeting, I can't remember, about my discussion with Spinell uh, Builders, uh, which would be the same kind of thing that we get from Larry, uh, from Harmon. Um, and I also have spilt, spoken to both the carpenters and the laborers. Um, I, I, I spoke with them about the same topic. It, this is not a unique to Seward. Uh, it's statewide. So I would suggest that this is not uh, a hot topic for our board anymore. And we've done what we can do. And we can advise council that, you know, whatever they've gained, I'm sorry, administration, from whatever they've gained by listening to our discussions is what they're going to get. The, the rest of our priorities, I think, uh, you know, we can look at it over the summer, and if we need to address something in the fall, we can. Well, it looks like we've got a, a topic for the work session on the 18th of May. Uh, I wonder if we want to set the topic for the September 7th meeting at this time. Anybody have any suggestions or thoughts on that? Well, I don't know, if the, but Madam Chair, uh, if there's any requirement from the administration or council that uh, that particular meeting has, we should take that up. But other than that, I'd suggest a review of activity over the summer about things we've dealt with. Uh, including, it, at that point, we could see where labor retention issues are in housing. Uh, I, I think the programs that uh, Director uh, Montgomery spoke to and Harbor Master that's, that's spoken to, I think all all should be on the table. I mean, and knowing where we're at to get going again. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, a review of where things stood at that point with the housing and all of that. Okay, anything else in terms of our schedule and uh, upcoming meeting agendas? Okay, moving on. Uh, next on the agenda is citizen comments. Um, we're done with business, so uh, there's no sign-in. Are there any citizens wishing to speak? 
Okay, seeing none. Uh, now we're on to board and administration comments in response to the lack of citizen comments. <laughs> Admin, you want to start? I would just thank PACAB for you guys' work this past year. You guys were dealing with some pretty big, um, impactful issues, and I just want to take the opportunity to say I hope you guys all have a wonderful summer. I'm sure I'll see you around town, but um, I hope you guys have a busy and successful summer, and I look forward to seeing you in the fall. Well, we still have a work session yep. in May, so you'll see us again one more yeah. time. Yeah. Norm? And then, and so, uh, like, you know, I want to thank Rob for coming over to give you guys a briefing. It's really nice to, to have that. And also, and, you know, if something comes up this summer, have a question, call me. Just reach out to me, and, you know, students, guys, they might reach out. If you have a question, I'll be glad to answer it. Bruce? Well, I, uh, I thank the board for the opportunity to uh, participate uh, in, in, I think, thoughtful discussion uh, with the administration and our, our council representative. Uh, uh, and, and I appreciate Mayor Terry's attendance at our meetings. I, uh, I will say again how enthusiastic I am in, in, in what I see in Seward. I have the opportunity to drive into town, and I have both a beautiful drive and changing from one environment to another. And when I come into town, into, into town, it's like <laughs> it's I see the tire full of air. You know, it, it's 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 great. It's ready to roll. And uh, I uh, I think I, I I mentioned someone just a little earlier. If we have limitations, there are limitations we're putting on ourselves. Because I think uh, we have all the opportunity to do all those magic things that other places in the country dream about. Besides living in a beautiful spot, we have an economy which is broad-based. And I've said it many times, I'll echo Willard Dunham's words, this is not a single industry town. And the, 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 the industries that we have here besides tourism and fishing and uh, uh, is education, uh, they're wonderful things. We're going to have a health industry here. You know, don't forget that this, uh, you know, there's a development just uh, south of Fort Raymond that'll, that's, that's kicked off, hopefully moving along, and, and other things. So I think we just need to be as uh, thankful as we can. And, uh, and I say with that, in Jerry Garcia's words, uh, you know, you be a little careful. You know, we don't get ourselves in a, in a bind, you know, when things look good. Uh, but that, uh, we, we can solve that problem by looking ahead. And I think we will. Everybody knows who Derek Garcia is, I say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this side of the bench. Thank you. Um, yeah, I uh, definitely appreciate hearing the, uh, the uh, report from the utility. And uh, congratulations to everybody that's... Um, this, uh, made that um, uh, investment into into the renewables. Um, and as far as the heat pumps go, I, I continue to be amazed at how well uh, they perform. And I almost question, like, it, once people figure out how great they are, a rebate is kind of, you know, it's, it's helpful. Um, it would be for sure, but uh, it's so nice having a warm, comfortable house. Um, so, Let's see, there was um, oh. <laughs> something I wanted to comment on, but I, I, I forgot. So I, I, yeah, thank you all for, uh, th and thank the, the city staff and, um, and uh, everybody that's made these meetings possible. I do feel like this has been a very productive um, uh, spring for, for PACAB and, and, uh, in general, and um, of course that is entirely possible with the help from, from all of the community and, uh, and the city staff. So thank you. And if you think of that last yeah. thing, let me know. <laughs> well, I don't really have anything. I apologize for being late. Uh, I know everybody has time schedules and things, and uh, I, I don't mean to be a burden. So um, I apologize, and uh, I guess I look forward to one more work session, and then uh, the craziness begins. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for some of us, the craziness oh, is hard. Okay. I, I did okay. remember. Um, so, so yeah. So, uh, I, we are at the end of the uh, of the year there with the, the training programs, and um, it's, and it's gone quite well. Um, 
uh, it's almost like a cautionary note for employers. It is hyper competitive. Uh, you know, I, I'm seeing offers that I, I, I wouldn't have believed last year for, for students. And hmm. um, so when you get, you know, if you're an employer and you see somebody, go after them because um, they have choices right now. And uh, yeah, it's good. It's great for them. So that's what I had to say. Thank you. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you to. Uh, to administration, thank you to the people that came and gave their reports. Um, thank you to Rob for the great overview of what's happening with the electric department. Um, we, you know, we do continue to have the struggle with housing, and uh, it is going to take a while to figure that out because I think what's happened is that whole sort of vacation rental industry sort of snuck in while we weren't necessarily watching. And um, so now there is a, a fair, and we're not the only ones. It's everywhere in Alaska. I was in Tucson a couple of weekends ago. They've got similar problems there. So that helps from a standpoint of being able to, to look at it and, and uh, network with other communities on solutions, I think. Um, I'm appreciative of uh, Mary Tukas and Mike Brown for putting their hats in the ring for the ad hoc committee. I'm excited to see what those guys come up with. And um, I think that's it. If there's nothing else, I will conclude this meeting at 1.20.